tonight, I want to talk about a subject that many times we gloss over in the Word of God. Sometimes we read about it, we think about it, but we don't give a lot of thought to it. And that is called the priesthood of the believer. How many of you know you're a priest tonight? Amen. What does that mean to say that you're a priest? We don't have a turnaround collar on. We don't have a, 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 a thing on our head or anything like that. But what does it mean to be a priest unto God? The Bible has a lot to say about the priesthood of the believer, and yet it's sometimes a forgotten subject or a misunderstood subject or a subject that we're often uninformed about. But the Bible has a lot to say about the priesthood of the believer. And tonight I want to walk through some of this, if I may, tonight very slowly, and hopefully we'll get a little handle on perhaps a little more idea of what it's all about. First and foremost, if you and I are born again, we are priests unto the Almighty God. A priest is someone who speaks to God on behalf of other people. A prophet is someone that speaks for God to other people. Does that make sense? So again, a priest speaks to God for other people, whereas a prophet speaks for God for to other people as well. Now we read the Word of God, and in the very beginning, God stipulated that the husband and the father was to be the priest of the home. We see many biblical examples of that throughout the reading of God's Word. Uh, for instance, in Genesis chapter 8, Noah was the priest of the home. In chapter 26, Abraham was the priest of the home. In Genesis 31, uh, 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 we know that uh, Jacob was the priest of the home. And there are many other biblical examples in the Old Testament uh, where the father and the husband was the priest of the home. But then God began to, later on, gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and he told them there, the people of Israel had an opportunity to become a kingdom of priests, and they could become a holy nation. Think about that. Of all the people upon the earth, God came to Israel and says, you all can be a kingdom of priests, and you can become a holy nation. At first, they said, hey, we, we sign up for this, God. That sounds good. You read in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a, pe a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words to the people and to the Lord. Pretty words. Oh, we'll do it, God. Isn't it amazing when God's speaking, when God's near, when God is close, the promises that we make. But when we're not in church, when the power of God's not moving, we often forget, renege on the words that we promised unto the Lord. But they forgot. They turned their back. They broke the word uh, that they, they gave to God. And as a result, the people did not adhere. They failed. They violated the word of God. And they failed to become uh, that uh, priesthood of believers. So what did God do? The Bible said then that God removed their opportunity to become priests and said he selected a family family by the name of Aaron. He called Aaron's family and also the tribes of Levi to minister unto the Lord. Now, I don't have the scripture up there, but in Exodus uh, chapter 19, uh, we find here, or Exodus 28 rather, uh, the typical priesthood uh, was contributed by God. He said, And take thou unto thee Abraham, Aaron thy brother, and his sons with his him uh, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, and uh, Aaron's sons. So we see from this that God made a beginning a priest with, the tri with, uh, uh, with Aaron and with his sons as well. Now that went on for century on top of century on top of century. All the priests came from the tribe uh, or through Aaron's family and the Levitical tribe. Now with that being said, for centuries and centuries it went that way until Jesus Christ died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross somewhere during that time, the Bible said that the veil of the temple ripped not from the bottom to the top, but it ripped from the top down to the bottom. And now everybody that's born again has access into the Holy of Holies. Understand, in the Old Testament, only the priesthood of Aaron had the opportunity to go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. 
Uh, they, had to, they had to put their priestly garments on. Uh, they had to have a rope tied around about them. They had to go under the most strict, uh, the most holiest way of walking into the holy place of God in order to offer up the sacrifice uh, that would cover their sins for an entire year. But when Jesus died on that cross, that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was ripped in two, and now they were able to walk in. So once again, we see from this uh, that the sacrifice of Jesus rent that veil, and from that moment, every believer, every believer became a select group of priests unto our God. Every believer is a priest, a part of a royal priesthood, the Bible said. When a person accepts Jesus Christ, you become a priest unto God. Now you and I ha can go directly to the very throne room of God ourself. I'm not trying to dish on anybody else's religion, but friend, I don't need to go to some confessional and confess my sin uh, to some man when I can go before the throne of God uh, like I own the place and tell and pour my heart out to him uh, in times of prayer. Today we have an opportunity to do what the nation of Israel failed to do, and we have opportunity to do uh, only what the, uh, the sons of Aaron was able to do uh, within the Old Testament. Thank God for that. Now Christians are priests. The word's indicative of a privilege in having access to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the priesthood of the believer, you and me, is based upon faith and it's based upon our acceptance of the great high priest himself. My faith is not in a church. My faith is not in a man. My faith is in the great high priest, Jesus Christ the Lord. So we are priests by, by faith in him and by accepting uh, him as the priesthood. No man puts us in the priesthood. We can't buy our way into the priesthood. Uh, no man can sanction us. No church uh, can sanction us tonight. Thank God uh, we cannot be placed there by church pronouncement, but the fact that we have been born again. Now the function of believer priest is to what? show forth the praises of God. That's what we do today. As priests, we show forth the praises of our God. The old priesthood, what did they do? They were constantly offering up sacrifices. They were constantly interceding for people. They were constantly, year, year after year, going into the Holy of Holies uh, with a blood sacrifice. We don't have to do that no more because once and for all, the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed. So the function of the priest today has changed from what it was uh, during the Old Testament time. Today we bring forth praises to him who has been our sacrifice. His blood has been shed. He has atoned for sin for time and for eternity. And today we bring forth praises unto him who's accomplished that for us even today. Every believer has the responsibility of the priestly function of teaching, of praising, and of witnessing. Amen. Now if you look in the Old Testament, which I know you have many times, in the temple and in the tabernacle, of all the articles of furniture that was there, there was never a chair. Because the priest never, ever finished his job. He was never able to sit down. He was constantly going in through the labor, constantly offering sacrifice, constantly going to the table of shoe bread, constantly going to the altar of incense, constantly going here, constantly going there. But today, Jesus, our high priest, has sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Why? His work is done. There's nothing that can be added to his blood, and thank God there's nothing that justifiably can be taken away from it. The blood that he shed 2,000 years ago, it satisfied God's righteousness. It satisfied God's wholeness. And bless God, it better satisfy you and me because we have peace with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And today Jesus has set down Set down the right hand of God the Father. Which means that no matter, friends, what goes on in your life or mine, it's already settled in heaven. God has a made up mind. The work is complete. It's finished. And he has set down. But that doesn't mean he set down on the job. <laughs> for he ever lives to make intercession for the saints of God. He is our great high priest interceding for us. What was he told Peter before he was crucified? He said, Peter, Satan had desired to sift you as wheat, but I pray for you. Yeah. And today Jesus Christ ever lives to pray for you. Amen. 
Friends, we got Jesus in heaven praying for us. We have the Holy Spirit praying through us. We have the Word of God to stand on it. What's our problem? God. Think about it. What's our problem? Come on. We've got Jesus in heaven praying for us. We have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, praying through us, and we have the promises of God to stand upon. We've got more today than any Old Testament saint ever had. We've got a better covenant. We've got a better Savior. We've got a better promise. We've got everything better than the Old Covenant ever had. And today you and I are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood unto our God. Now, what's the foundation of the Christian priesthood? Well, first of all, the living stone. The priesthood of the believer is based upon a living stone, which is who? Jesus Christ. Uh, in uh, 1 Peter 2, 4, To whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. The apostle Peter had good cause to use this term living stone. Why? Because you're reading the Word of God. He'd been the one to express his confession of faith in Jesus Christ. You remember uh, in Matthew 16, they come into the coast and Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi. He said, disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Oh, some say you're Elias or Jeremiah, one of the prophets, but who do you say I am? And Peter said, oh, you're Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the highest revelation any individual can ever come to. He's Christ, the Son of of the living God. He said, but who, and I, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded to Peter's confession. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the foundation of the church of God and practical Christianity was found the conversation between Jesus and Peter himself. Peter alludes to the rock more times than one. Also, he's the living God. He said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. So the foundation of the Christian priesthood is solid. It's built on a living God and the living stone. Are you with me? Based on the living God and the living stone. Now the living God's foundation is sound and sure. Again, look at Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. The same statement is quoted in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. God has laid the foundation. The foundation is His Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now what about living stones? The life of Christ, the Son of the living God, it flows from Him into every one of us that receives Him. Notice again, 1 Peter 2, 5. I read it just a moment ago. Again, he says, Ye also are living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All believers, we build our lives upon the living stone, Jesus Christ. And we are living stones ourselves because we partake of what the risen Christ has done for us. Now, friends, this is more than some type, of, uh, some type of metaphor. We draw our strength. We draw our peace. We draw our joy. We draw everything we have from the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. Everything. So, once again, He is a living stone. Christians are living stones. He is our precious stone, and thank God Christians are precious stones. He also was the rejected stone, and Christians are rejected stones, and because we are identified with Him in every respect of life. As they rejected Him, they're going to reject us. But did that stop Him from fulfilling the mission? No, and it ought not stop us from fulfilling our mission. Around the world, Christians are more than just laughed at and ostracized. Christians are burned. They're tied to the stake. They're fed to animals. They're grossly martyred and tormented. They reject them and they reject their message. And he said, if we suffer with him, we will one day reign with him. You see, everybody in America, for the most part, is Christians. We want the glory and we want the crown but we don't want the cross and we don't want the suffering. Friend, I'm not a dumb man. I don't want to suffer either. 
For when I'm telling you, all that live in Christ Jesus, all that are godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Amen. And what I'm trying to say is we better make sure we are hooked up, tied up, and tied into the living God and the living stone so that we will be living stones and not just some rolling stone rolling away into oblivion when persecution comes. Does that make sense? He wants us to be tied up with him. So the solid foundation of the Christian priesthood, my friend, is extremely sure, steadfast, and thank God it is unmovable. Why? It flows from the living God. It flows from the living stone, and we become those living stones. All life flows from him. It flows into us. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He is the bread of life. We eat of him. We eat from him. That does not mean that we're a bunch of cannibals drinking his blood and eating his flesh. It simply means that we plead that blood. We, we worship the God who gave us that blood. And we read and eat of the word of God, which is nourishment to our soul. Thank God it's milk for the baby. And it's strong meat for those that can have it. And Paul speaks of the stone. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, he said, And did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Ephesians 2, 20, the apostle Paul said, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, all believers are not just part of the priesthood. We are part of a holy priesthood. And sometimes this scares us because we don't look holy. We don't act holy. We don't feel holy. We don't seem to be holy. We don't smell holy. And yet the Bible says we are holy. When I was in college many years ago, Brother Shelton attends church here on Sunday nights. One of my professors 7.30 in the mornings on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Herb, you may have been there as well. He'd come in early, 7.30 in the morning. Good morning, saints. And we'd turn around and go, who's he talking to? He's talking to us. We didn't look like or feel like or smell like saints. But every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, good morning, saints. I believe he was trying to put something in us. That you are somebody because of whose you are. Amen. And because of what he has done for you. If we try to live this Christian life through what we feel about ourselves, what we think about ourselves, we're not going to enjoy it. We're not going to make it. But if we can see ourselves through the eyes of Him, if we can accept what He's accepted of us, that we are friends with Him, heirs with Him, joint heirs with Him, Christianity would be a whole lot more exciting. And I think we'd be a whole lot more effective as well. All believers are a holy priesthood. Christians are not only living stones, but part of a spiritual house, the holy priesthood. Again, 1 Peter 2, 5, I read it again. Ye also as living stones are built upon a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes. Now, you have written this before, as we said, the holy priesthood. The priesthood of the Christian is our birthright. Think about it. The, 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 the priesthood of the Christian is our birthright. When you're born again, you become a priest with the rights and privileges of that office. In the Old Testament, the only way you could be a priest if you were born into the right family, and that was Aaron's family. We've been born into the right family. We have been born again. We now belong to a royal house and to a holy house, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So friend, when the devil says you're a nobody, and when you begin to think about all the stuff you've done to everybody else, and you feel like you're just this, that, and the other, and just trashy, may I just remind you, go back to the Word of God and say, Devil, my Bible said I have been born again. Yeah. I have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been adopted as a family of God. I am not only a priest unto God, I am a holy priest unto God, and I am part of a royal family. I'm a royal priest of God. Now take that down, you ugly mouth, and swallow it. I believe we need to talk back to the enemy that's talking to us. We need to tell him who we are and act like it. 
Now to be holy and be royal, I think it's a responsibility. Remember, the Old Testament, to be a holy royal priesthood, they had to do things the right way. They didn't walk before the presence of God with dirty garments on. They didn't walk into the Holy of Holies, just, hey, go in and talk to Daddy. Well, no, none of that going to go on, friend. They had to have a respect and honor to their God. And if we're not careful in American culture and American Christianity, we become too buddy-buddy with our Heavenly Father. We act like He's a Santa Claus in the sky. We act like He's the bellhop and we ring the bell in the name of Jesus. Here He comes to serve us. And somebody said many years ago, the American church today, we're playing marbles with diamonds. And we have forgotten the wholeness of our God. We, te- we, we treat him triteful and disrespectful so many times. But if you and I can get our arms wrapped around, we are a holy priesthood. Yes. We are a royal priesthood to our God. I believe we'll have a whole lot more respect for the God that we serve. Again, under the old covenant, the high priest could enter the holy of holies only once a year by blood sacrifice. If they did not enter into that Holy of Holies the correct way, they could be killed. But under grace today, as believers, that veil's been torn. We can boldly come, but I still think respectfully. More times than not, when I hit my knees here early in the morning, right there, I moved over here because school goes on over there. (laughs) Early in the morning, I often go before God, wash me in your blood. Get my attitude where it belongs, God. Let me bring my thoughts into your captivity. I'm nothing in me at all that can approach you, but through the blood of your Son, through the sanctifying power of your Word, see the blood of your Son as I come to you. I'll tell you what, friends, you put yourself in the right attitude of prayer, it's amazing what God will do. In Hebrews 9, 27, but into, the, but into the second went the high priest alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself for he, and for the errors of the people. Again, to become a priest, there must be a high priest. In order for us to be a priest, there must be a high priest. Peter used the term a holy priesthood because he knew the Old Testament what it meant to be holy to go before the Lord. And we are a holy people coming before a holy Lord. Hebrews 9.11, the Bible tells us, but Christ can't come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building. There was a requirement of one qualified to be a high priest and Jesus is the only one qualified. Amen. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's past the heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. In the Old Testament, Aaron had to offer up a sacrifice for his sins and the sins of the people. But our high priest, he never sinned. The blood he shed was not for him. The blood he shed is for me. The blood he shed is for us. Thank God for the high priest. Let me hasten on tonight if I may. Notice also, if you will, the Christian priest is a member of a chosen generation. The first thought is this. Is Peter talking about Israel? People say, well, it seems like he's talking about Israel here. But if you read 1 Peter 1 and 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, you you got the answer. In 1 Peter 1, 9, he said, but ye are a chosen generation. That means we as believers, we have become the elect of God. Here we refer you back to the fact that he has chosen us in Christ Jesus the Lord. Friend, I've been elected in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Again, the believers are all priesthood. Again, in 1 Peter 2, 9, uh, and, and, and he says here uh, that, uh, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, as holy priests, we draw nigh to God and we present praises unto our God. Friends, you and I don't praise God when we feel like it. We don't praise God just when the music's going. We don't praise God just when we come to church. Every day of our life, I love the new song we're singing. Day and night, night and day, let the ship arise. Don't you love that? Day and night, night and day. I wake up in the middle of the night. Day and night, night and day. 
makes you wish you could sing, you know? But I made up my mind years ago, I've got a crow voice, and God's going to hear this crow croak. That's how it goes. God's got some beautiful birds that sing. He's got these old crows that just quack, quack, and I want to quack, quack my way into glory by the grace of God. As royal priests, believers go forth in every aspect of life to show forth the virtues and the graces of God. Now, the apostle does not say you ought to be royal priest. He says here in the Word of God, you are a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Notice, if you will, the term holy means, actually means in the Greek, people. You are a holy people. We serve a holy God. We read a holy Bible. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to be a holy people. We are going to a holy place. We worship a holy God. And everything about us ought to be holiness. Now, we get it confused in culture today, many, and especially mountain culture where I'm from. We often in the mountains think you've got to dress a certain way to be holy. I've seen a lot of men that wear nothing but black suits, blue suits, white shirts with black and blue, black ties and, 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 and blue ties. I've seen women that wear plain dresses with their hair up high, their long hair up to here, dragging the ground, no makeup. And let me tell you, some barns need painting, let's just be honest. And I've just seen people, they just dress a certain way and they think that's holy. It's not, it's tradition. Jesus told, I'm not, I'm not dishing it, don't misunderstand. What I am saying, if that's what we think holiness is, it's not. There's, there's holiness in every generation. There's modesty in every generation too, by the way. But what I guess I'm trying to say, Jesus said, outwardly, it's whitewashed sepulchres. But on the inside, it can be full of dead men's bones. And sometimes we can dress the talk of holiness, but only God knows what's going on on the inside. I remember many years ago, perhaps you've heard me tell the story, but there was a young man that graduated Bible college. He went back to one of those churches up in the mountains, and it was one of the holiness churches, the way they dressed, you know, just dressed holy. And they were very proud of him. He walks into church that day with a, loud shirt, polka dotted tie, and a real loud sport coat, sporting rings and gold watches, bracelet on this side. I mean, <gasps> they like sucked every bit of the oxygen right of that building. He walked in. And after the service was over with, the old lady came up to him. She said, son, I enjoyed your sermon, but I want you to know right now, your tie offended me dearly. He said, sister, if you'd see my underwear, you'd probably backslide. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe sometimes we need a little joke. I don't know, a little jolt. Friends, it, we're talking about wholeness unto God. It's not about what we put on or don't put on. I've got a news flash for you. God sees every one of us we take a shower. But no matter what we put on, God always sees what's going on down here. And wholeness is a matter of the heart. And once the heart is right, the outside will take care of itself. Yeah. Okay? But too many times we try to take care of the outside, camouflaging what's really going on in here. But we are a holy priesthood unto our God. Again, a holy nation, it means believers are holy people. A peculiar people means valuable people. Not because of what we might be or, or, or might own, but because we're valuable because Jesus died for us. Would you believe this tonight? If you were the only person on this earth, I believe Jesus would have died for you. Now that's hard for me to wrap my brain around. But if I was the only man on this earth, I believe he loved me so much, he would die for me. That makes me peculiar. That makes me special in many, many ways. That makes me valuable. Let me try to bring this to a close if I can. I've skipped a whole lot. In Acts 16, verses 19 through 34, I think will serve as an illustration of what a priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy people looks like. Paul and Silas have been put in jail at Philippi. You recall at the midnight hour, 
Have they been beaten? Their feet were in stocks, their hands were in stocks. They were embarrassed, humiliated, hungry. The list goes on and on. Wounds on their back that was excruciating, painful. What were they doing? They weren't complaining. They weren't murmuring. They weren't blaming God. They weren't cursing the people that arrested them. But they realized that they were priests unto God. And what do priests do? Show forth praises unto God. So here they are in this prison house. They were not complaining or pitying themselves. The two living stones were receiving their strength from the living stone. The two holy priests that were there in that prison were offering a sacrifice of praise unto God. Praise is indeed a sacrifice. I don't always enjoy praising God. Don't look at me like that. You don't either. You know why? The flesh don't want to. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when we are down and beaten and humiliated in prison as they were, one of the last things that I think we want to do is praise God. But you see, they had a relationship with God on outside that prison that helped them not only to endure, but to endure what was going on inside that prison. And if we don't have a holy relationship with our holy God outside of circumstances and outside of trials, those trials may very well kill us when we get in them. Friends, we are winning our victory today, yesterday, and we're winning our victory for tomorrow, today. We don't have time to pray through when they arrest you and throw you in prison. You had better be prayed through before that time comes. Are you with me? And they apparently had prayed through because they're in prison. And they, they could have said, now God, you led us here. You brought us over to Macedonia. We want to go to Asia. Uh, we were going to go over there, but you sent us over here. You forbade us to go to Asia. Here we are. We heard the Macedonian call. You sent us over here to speak to a bunch of men. And we end up with a bunch of women down by the river. We cast a demon out of this girl. And they throw us in prison. This is not fair. They didn't do that. They knew the steps of a righteous man's order of God. And they said, here we are. And at midnight, the scripture says... And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. They were also as royal priests. Now, how does this show off in action? First of all, in the words of Paul, he said to this jailer, Do thyself no harm, for we're here. When the jailhouse began to rock, the prison doors opened. The man took out the sword, ready to kill himself. Uh, because in that day, if you were watching a, uh, you were a guard, and you were watching a prisoner, and the prisoner escaped on your watch, you had to pay the price that the prisoner would pay. In this case, it was death. Paul said, put your swords away. We are here. Now, how does this virtue show in action? The voice of the holy priest offered sacrifice and praise to God and did their work before the throne of God. Did you get that? As royal priests in prison, hallelujah, they were singing. As royal priest praising God, it reached heaven. When God inhabits the praises of his royal priesthood, you and me as believers, let me tell you something. When you take a stand for him, I believe he gets up to take a stand for you and me. Then the words of the royal priest went directly to the jailer's heart, and those words brought conviction to where they got saved. So a holy priest brought praise to God. A royal priest is speaks to men on behalf of God. And that's what, P, what Paul did. As a result, they gave their heart to the Lord. So the two living stones, the two holy priests, the two royal priests glorified God and the jailer and their families got saved. To me, this illustrates how you and I can live out every day of our life as a royal priesthood, as a holy priesthood unto our God. That's the priesthood of the believer. If you're a Christian, there's one God, one mediator between God and man, that man, Christ Jesus the Lord. Church, I hope you've gotten something out of this tonight. Amen. So as you leave, understand you are somebody. Not because of where you live, what you wear, where you, where you work, or how much money's in your bank. You're somebody because you know the only one that matters. Amen.